Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Rare Book Room. My name is Olivia, and I help direct events here at The Strand. For a little bit of history, The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Ave's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until, after 93 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third-generation owner Nancy Bass Whedon. Under Nancy, the Strand is not only surviving in an increasingly competitive and unsure environment, but it is thriving. The Strand continues to famously hold over 18 miles of used, new, and rare books, hosts nearly 400 events a year, and is now opening a second location this spring on the Upper West Side at 81st in Columbus. <laughs> In large part, this is thanks to all of you. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, we are celebrating the lease of Brian Platzer's new book, The Body Politic, an elegant and perceptive novel of buried secrets that find their way to the surface and how everything can shift and eventually erupt over the course of a life. Brian Platzer has an MFA from the Johns Hopkins Writing Seminars and a BA from Columbia University. His writing has appeared often in The New Yorker's Shouts and Murmurs and Sweeney's Internet Tendency, as well as The New York Times, The New Republic, Salon, and elsewhere. Joining Brian in conversation tonight is Amanda Mull. As a staff writer at The Atlantic, she covers topics at the intersection of health and culture, including wellness, food, the beauty and fashion industries, cannabis, consumerism, and the ways technology changes how we relate to others and ourselves. Before joining The Atlantic, her writing was featured in Rolling Stone, New York Magazine, Elle, Pacific Standard, Vox, and In Style, among others. Please join me in welcoming Brian and Amanda to The Strand. is a nice thing. Do I go? I forget. Yeah. We discussed this. Go for it. Go. What a wonderful group of people you are. This is, Back home, baby. yeah, this is, this is, um, I'm full of joy and gratitude. Thank you very, 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 very much for, for being here. And, um, I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit. And then you guys can ask a little bit. And we'll have a good time. The book is about four friends. One of them has a chronic illness. Another one is married to the one with the chronic illness. Other guy is friends with the chronic illness guy. And then a woman is <laughs> in a relationship with the friend. You don't need to, to remember all that. What I am going to do is try to read the closest thing to a self-contained story in the book. It's three, four pages of the friend of the chronic illness guy's childhood. So here we go. Tazio was 12 years old the last time he saw his father. There was still a half hour left in Batman Returns when Mr. DiVincenzo stood up from the couch and told Tazio to get in the truck. He lived in Ronkonkoma, 10 minutes on the Long Island Expressway from Tazio's mother's house in Islip. Tazio was disappointed to be going back so soon. He'd been looking forward to spending time with his father, and all they'd done so far was to sit at home and watch movies he'd already seen. Tazio was small for 12, and his father was short too, but thick, muscular, with a belly that seemed to increase his strength. They were both heavy, they both wore, excuse me, heavy, oversized New York Islander t-shirts though neither could have named a player on the team other than Patrick Flatley, whom Mr. DiVincenzo told everyone he liked because of the nickname, the chairman of the boards. Mr. DiVincenzo's Chevy had been painted green for as long as Tazio could remember. Its cabin smelled of oily pipe wrenches, circular saws, plungers, and toilet snakes, American spirit rolling tobacco, and dried sweat. At Tazio's feet, a bright orange extension cord coiled over and around crushed cans of rolling rock and ginger ale. As they pulled out, Tazio hoped someone would see him riding in his father's truck. He wished someone would take their picture. Everything good, Mr. DiVincenzo said. Tazio rarely spoke, not even to his mother and father. He knew other kids thought he was a weirdo, 
Later, when he grew up and became a thoughtful, brooding, handsome man, he would paint on canvases, have close friends, and confidently explain politics at parties to groups of strangers. But at 12, he was quiet. His father had said that was okay, which made Tazio feel happy and also embarrassed. They'd gotten onto the LIE, but were heading in the wrong direction, driving deeper out onto Long Island instead of to his mother's house. When Tazio realized this, his body filled with a tart, adrenaline-spiked heat that quickly faded, and that afterwards he would have done anything or said anything to recover. You good, Patatino? Mr. DiVincenzo said. Everything good? Tazio nodded, slightly warmed again by the pet name, Little Potato. He watched the concrete partitions that divided the road from the trees and anchored the bases of the lamp poles. He loved his father so much he couldn't stand it. See those poles, Mr. DiVincenzo said, pointing with his forehead? You think they're aluminum or steel? I'll give you two guesses. Steel was too heavy and expensive. Aluminum was a surprise, though. Mr. DiVincenzo was laughing, and Tazio realized with a twinge that it had been a joke. Two guesses. Look, I get you being angry with me, but I want things to be better between us, okay? Hey, I'm a good guy, I promise. That's all I'm trying to be. If that's not good enough for your mother, then... Mr. DiVincenzo shook his head at the, wheel sh at the windshield. Better? Tazio didn't know that things weren't good between his father and himself. Between his father and his mother, sure, but to Tazio, his father was just his father. Papa, he called his father Mr. DiVincenzo in front of the customers. Some of the older ones would laugh and rub his head. Tazio was too old for a person to still be getting his head rubbed, but he couldn't think of a way to bring this up. He sat up higher in his seat and relaxed his hands, which, with which he had been squeezing and twisting the seatbelt. They were pulling off at a rest stop. You'll see. It'll be for the best, Mr. DiVincenzo said. I never knew how to make that woman happy. This way she'll get you all to herself. Tazio's hands tightened again around the seatbelt. His father seemed to be finishing up a conversation he couldn't remember starting. I love your mother. I always will. The problem is... Mr. DiVincenzo squinted at something at the, next, at the rest stop parking lot. The problem is that she's, the problem is that she's what? In the entire world, Tazio suddenly recognized this is what he wanted to know most, to know what his mother actually was. She was hot-tempered, formal, Mexican, in a way that made him think strangely of lords and ladies. She spoke perfect accented English at her work and only ever Spanish at home with Tazio. To his abiding shame, Tazio had always felt more comfortable with his father. Mr. DiVincenzo parked the truck. The rest stop was just a lookout point on a small cliff, the water below dark blue and choppy. Mama's what? He talks, Mr. DiVincenzo said. The problem is that she's what? Tazio said. I don't want to run down your mother, Mr. DiVincenzo said. I wouldn't do that. Tazio felt like he could cry. He had been so close to a real answer. He clenched his jaw until his teeth squeaked. He wanted to tell his father to go fuck himself. You and me, we're the same, Mr. DiVincenzo said. We're good guys. We are. What else more do they want? We're just good guys. He opened his mouth again, hesitated, and then said, you know I'm going away. You know that. You're smart, right? I don't need to tell you. Without looking, Mr. DiVincenzo reached over and rubbed Tazio's head. Tazio felt an unbearable urge to bite his hand. I was thinking, though, sometimes you could just look out at the water, you know? If you ever think about me, only if you want. I'll be looking back, okay? That's all I'm saying. I'll be thinking about you, too. Mr. DiVincenzo nodded out at the water, and it took Tazio a moment to understand that he wasn't talking about the beach. What were you going to say about Mama, Tazio said. Don't give her a hard time, okay, Tazio's father said on the drive back to Tazio's mother's house. You two got to look after each other now. In the driveway, Mr. DiVincenzo got out of the truck and came around to give Tazio a goodbye hug. Tazio just turned and went inside. Even as a grown-up, even as a grown-up in Washington, D.C., having left his fiancée and with his father long dead, Tazio thinks often about that afternoon. He thinks about it when people call him kind or loyal or good. Tazio is good. All his friends say so. David, Michael, even Tess. You're such a good guy, Tess says. And Tazio laughs silently. A good guy, no such thing. Hey.
Thank you. Nice work. Uh, so I'm Amanda Mull. I'm a staff writer at The Atlantic, and I uh, got a sneak preview of the book. Uh, so just for context for the questions that we're gonna that we're I'm gonna be asking, the stuff we're gonna be talking about, uh, there are two couples uh, in the book. Tess and David. Tess is an actress. David uh, has an MBA, used to work for Pepsi. Uh, and Tazio and Angelica, uh, who are not married yet. Tazio works in politics, used to be an artist, maybe is still an artist. Uh, and Angelica is a dentist. Uh, and David, one of the four main characters, is uh, much of the action in the book is, is around his affliction with a neurological disorder. Uh, that causes a lot of dizziness, migraines, vision problems, things like that. And uh, you have a somewhat similar problem to David's in the book. Uh, Simi similar, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so how did, you, how did you decide that you wanted to write about that in, in a fictionalized way? You described my book a lot better than I described my book. Thank, thank you. Listen to what she said, not what I did. Um, I was really, really sick for a long time. It was a total nightmare that pretty much incapacitated me. So for, for two and a half years, I was unable to do anything. I, I woke up every morning and I felt as though I was, you know, 30 drinks in. I, I couldn't see straight. I couldn't teach. I couldn't be alone with my kids. I couldn't write. I couldn't talk on the phone. I, I couldn't do anything. And, and looking back on those years now, I don't I don't remember a lot of the details. They're, they're, they're a bit of a, a, a haze for me. And after I found you know, some right combination of medications to mitigate the symptoms long enough to allow me to teach those three wonderful people once in a while and to write a little bit and to hang out with my colleagues and friends and, and wife and, and everybody else, I, I started trying to figure out what the last couple of years had been like. And, and I think as a way of, of trying to remember and trying to process and, and trying to figure out what I had lost in that time and, and how I wanted to, to move forward, this was a, an exercise in, in trying to think through what it meant to be incapacitated with kids, with a family, with friends. And, and then as I, as I started writing, I, I realized that if I was just going to write from the perspective of the sick guy, it was going to be an unreadably miserable <laughs> book. So I, I started expanding the horizons a, a, a little bit and thinking from the perspectives of those people who, who bore with me for, for all those years. Um, and I think it was a, a really lovely opportunity to, to, to be a little bit less in my own head and a little bit less selfish and to think what it was like for my wife to see me suffering every day and to take care of me and the kids, to see what it was like to be my parents and sister and colleagues and business partner and, and friends and students and, and everything. You know, I, I was so in my own myopic, selfish world that being forced to try to think about those experiences from all of your perspectives was, I think, a healthy thing and, and a really um, emotional thing for me. Yeah, that all of that totally came through in the book, I thought. Um, I'm wondering when you take something, an experience that's so personal and, and then decide to fictionalize it, because the book is not at all an autobiographical novel. Um, the book is not at all not an at autobiographical all. novel. It is, it is if you walk away that. from tonight knowing one <laughs> thing, it's that as far as I know, my wife has not cheated on me. <laughs> Yes. The, so, but I think that's an important distinction to make when you're... A very important distinction. Yes. <laughs> important to, very important to some people in the room. Yes. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at something like that, to take a, a very personal experience and then to put it into fiction, how do you decide how much of you goes? Where are the lines that you decided to draw? I started just trying to write through the experiences of, of being sick for a couple of years. And I just didn't, I, I didn't feel like that was a, a book. It felt like, uh, like I was whining, you, you know? And, and I, I started trying to figure out how much I could balance what I wanted to do, which was give the real impression of what it's like to live with a, an invisible, debilitating illness and to get inside that, 
that mindset and the emotions and the loneliness and the combination of the daily pain and the existential horror that that pain might last for, for the rest of my life, but like also tell a rollicking good story. Cause like it's, it's really sad and boring, you know, actually going, going through it. So I, I, I took a character who is kind of like my, myself, um, except the, the way I actually did it was I imagined um, like this really nice guy I went to summer camp with, and then I made him like a brooding, sick, sad, miserable person. Um, and I ended up with the main character. And I, <laughs> I, and I, I, I tried to imagine what would happen um, to that sort of nicer version of myself going through these experiences and what he would want and how he would go about getting things. And then I tried to imagine the other main perspective characters, like the, the wife and the friend and the, and the other friend and sort of what they would want in a situation and how they would go about trying to confront past injustices in their past, and et cetera. So I, I think that even if the primary goal was to give a sense of my vision of the world and how you know somebody suffering under these um, health conditions and the, these in this political moment feels, I, I think even more importantly at that point is to tell a story where someone really wants to know what's gonna happen next and people care. So I, I took as much from real life as I felt a reader could tolerate and then I exaggerated it into things that I think the reader would be excited to, to care about and to, to find out what happens. Yeah. Now, for a book about being dizzy and depressed and, and you know, all of these attendant emotions that happen with chronic illness and that happen, you know, post-Trump, much of the book, as you might have guessed from the title, is, is also contending with, uh, you know, the aftermath of the 2016 election. Uh, but I found it to be, like, sort of a page-turner. It, it you know, it, it moves, it felt vivid to me. How do you take experiences that are sort of washed out when you are living them, I assume, and, and make that into something that moves? Well, I think you have to create moments where things matter, right? Where as, as opposed to actually living it, where it's two years of waking up and going to doctor's appointments and sometimes crying and then going to sleep. If you just focus on the moments where there is something at stake, something that, either the main character like needs, whether it's a doctor's appointment where he's so hungry for the answer that it becomes almost a, a, a thriller, you know, like will he get the, the answer or not? Or if it's a woman living under Trump and Trump reminds her of a former um, lover slash um, sexual harasser and, you know, op oppressor, if seeing a moment where she's at home thinking about how horrible that is isn't, isn't a book, but setting it up with an architecture where she is going to confront that person is a way to take the psychology of the moment and put it into action that the reader cares about. So the, the idea is to try to keep the emotions as true as you can while you know, creating a series of escalating um, mysteries and uh, thrilling events that the reader just really wants to see what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned confrontation, and, and a lot of the book is built around confrontation, which to me feels very true to how life felt in, you know, November, December, January, after, after the election. So that felt really, really true to me, but also uh, the people doing the confronting at its most dramatic in this book are women and the female characters and much of the book is written from the perspective of the female characters and they felt really vivid and true to life to me too so and they were confronting people over experiences that are fundamentally in some ways female experiences so how did you try to think about portraying that as someone who can't have those experiences themselves i thank you for for, for saying that i I kind of think men and women are the same. I, I, I realize that there are certain experiences, especially in the book, that happen to women and who women are uniquely in a position to be made to suffer in certain, especially sexual ways, you know, that, that we're reading about and hearing about and that are miserable to, to, to think fully about. But I, instead of pretending that I myself was a, 
a victim of you know sexual assault and and trying to think like what a lady would think during that i i tried to put my mind in a human being who was wronged and who was looking for some justice and and i feel like it is a very specific type of justice with a very specific vocabulary that we're now reading more and more about but it, but at the time there's a woman who was wronged who's lived years having been wronged who very much wants to feel that she has come to some sort of place where she doesn't need to live her life feeling wronged anymore. And I, I, I think about what I would want in that situation and what people I love would want in, in that situation. And I try to be as emotionally honest as I can. So I, I, I do see gender as an, in, as an important differentiating factor in terms of the type of experiences that people have. But I don't as a sort of a psychological um, way of people fighting through trauma in their past. Mm -hmm. Much of the action of the book is set in the aftermath of the 2016 election, like I mentioned. What made you decide to set it there specifically? Well, I, I stumbled into it. Like, I was living in my own confusion state of dread and uncertainty where everything, you know, with my... I was, I was dizzy all day, every day, essentially, for for these couple of years, and every day I, I, never, I never felt like I really understood the lay of the land. I didn't really know what that day was going to be like. Things that I took for granted were all of a sudden taken away from me. And after Trump was elected, uh, a shitload of people started feeling like that too. You know, and the, 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 the parallel was, was unavoidable, where I, I remember the subway ride after the morning, you know, when, when Trump was elected, and I, the only thing I could compare it to was 9-11, and it, it sounds so extreme and, and so ridiculous, but, but like, you remember people were like gallantly getting up to offer other people seats even if they didn't need them, like there was this whole like performance of altruism and, and kindness and disorientation, and I, and I felt like so much of the, the, the hideousness and, and uncertainty that I had been experiencing my, in myself, in, in my own sort of lonely mind, I, I saw all of a sudden manifested in the entire city. And to, it, it let me tell my personal story on a much larger stage that made me feel like there really might be a novel here, that it's not just you know, a, a book for people who feel like they haven't been heard and who are invisibly ill and, and want to feel like other people feel like that. But I think it's a book for, for everybody all of a sudden living in the United States in a way that we're surprised by the United States we woke up in one morning and, and sort of how that affects our daily vision of the world. One of my big takeaways from the book was about how it seems like a lot of people have sort of gone about their lives in the 2010s uh, and sort of lost some of the like real community ties to people around them that uh, that are valuable in times of uh, sudden illness that are valuable in times of uh, sudden political disruption um, do you think that's the case was that how much did you think about the concept of community going into this I, I think that I, I I know that not as many most people aren't as lucky as I was in the 2010s. You know, like I, I met the, the, the woman of my dreams and fell in love. I got to teach and write and like things, things were really good. And, and I do think that some people who had as much luck as I did and others who were just like really happy with Obama didn't, didn't feel the need to create, uh, you know, little worlds where they could be safe and honest and themselves. And, and I think that, that that is one of the reasons the, the shock of Trump and the current political moment was so devastating. Because there's, you know, the, the, a lot of us were in a, in a bit of a warm bath for eight years, feeling like we could tend our own gardens and the world, you know, we disagreed with things or we agreed with them, but politics was, was politics, you know. And, and a lot of us, I certainly was lucky enough for that not to affect me on a, on a daily basis. And I think looking back, I was naive. And it it was simmering there, and there were a lot of suffering people who maybe didn't have a political voice or, or whom I, I wasn't aware of. Um, but then you wake up either as somebody who can't be with his kids or teach or somebody who is all of a sudden represented by, you know, the, the worst American is now in charge of America. And it, it, it does feel like the, the carpet got pulled out from under us a, a little bit. And that, that maybe if we had 
gone to a slightly more awful human being before Trump, we would have been better prepared for you know, the, the, the family and society and community that, that a lot of us needed after Trump, during Trump. Yeah. Uh, something I found sort of interesting, and maybe this is out of left field, but the, your characters don't spend a great deal of time on the internet or on their phones, was <laughs> which was sort of pleasant because it's not a whole lot of fun to read, like people describing text messages. Um, how, how much of that was intentional? It, it was intentional. I appreciate you bringing that up. It was, well, one, I think that writing text messages is really hard because like if you just like if you imagine going to your phone and printing out your text messages like no one would want to read that and <laughs> and it, it they would come off as awkward and I think that's one of the appeals of snapchat which I'm too old to understand but like I I think the idea of of having messages that that disappear shortly after you write them is the opposite of writing text messages that will live in a novel forever <laughs> and I, I I did in my attempts to try to you know make technology a, a part of the experience, I, I failed and I gave up, is, is the more honest answer. The more high-minded answer is that a lot of this novel takes place in the characters' heads. You know, people go through the trauma of losing a parent, or the trauma of illness, or the trauma of sexual assault, and th there's something very um, su superficial, I think, about, you know, one's device in those situations. Uh, also, the book's about kids and how kids deal with, with these experiences and the times where they're resilient and less so. And, and I, I did want to live in a world where the characters had important aspects of their lives that they cared a lot about, and the distractions weren't sort of worthy of, of their mental energy in the way that they tend to dominate most of our lives. Mm -hmm. What the characters do do in the movie is watch some cable news, uh, which is, is uh, something that unfortunately probably a lot of people do. <laughs> if you work in cable news, sorry I said unfortunately. Um, but what is, what is your relationship to cable news? I, I think the same as everyone else's. Like it's objectively terrible and I watch it. Like it's, I, I, I watch it until Alex tells me to, to stop yelling at the television and then I tell her I'm not and then she says, yes you were and then I grade their essays. Like I, I the, 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 the problem with cable news now is it's, it's like a pretty good show. Like I, I, I think that for, for a long time, especially under Obama, you know, MSNBC and CNN were boring, and Fox was reprehensible, and like, what are you gonna do? But, but now, you know, stuff is happening, and like, the guy gets impeached, but it doesn't matter, and then all the ladies, they're gonna be president, and then people are sexist, so we don't vote for them, and you know, uh, Chris Matthews says crazy stuff, and he has to leave the next day, and it's, like, it is a reality show in, in a way that it didn't used to be. So I, I get the appeal of, of cable news, I mean, the problem is that it rots your soul. So as you watch <laughs> the as you watch the the, the television, <laughs> the television as you watch TV, um, no longer having as severe a chronic illness as you used to, um, it, it is a, sort of objectively absurd, you know, that these people are yelling and screaming and everything is breaking news. And I mean, I'm doing the same stand-up routine that you've seen people who are funnier than I am do, but I. I do think the problem with cable news is it doesn't matter at all, and then it really matters. Because like, you remember the first cabinet that our president had? Like everybody kind of made sense. Like they, they were people who had waged war and business and things, and like they're terrible, but like kind of okay, we get it. But then the second wave was like the Scaramucci guy and Giuliani <laughs> and like all of these like um, reality TV people who are all of a sudden like in oh charge God. of the economy, you know? And I. It, it makes me feel almost better about watching cable news because it's how our country is, is being run. So I think this is, we're in, we're in a very complicated time with this fast twitch news cycle and in Twitter and, and cable news and the rest of it where I, I think we want to believe it's a guilty pleasure that doesn't matter that we have to cut ourselves off from that you know is, is the same as watching Full House or drinking whiskey or whatever you guys do instead. But it might be more valuable than watching Full House or, or drinking whiskey, um, except for drinking whiskey. <laughs> drinking whiskey is more fun. Um, 
That wasn't an answer to your question. I'm, I'm sorry. I That's okay. I have a complicated relationship with cable news. <laughs> Don't we all? Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of examination has been done culturally by people who work at institutions like the, like the one I work at about how cable news has affected conservatives and older people. Um, not as much as has been, has been said or been examined about how it affects younger people or liberals, but which sort of surprised me by how big of a role uh, it plays in this book because these people are relatively young and living in Brooklyn. Uh, so how did you go about parsing that relationship? I really thought John Edwards was great. Like 15 years ago. When, I remember thinking that. Whenever it was, he was so Southern and charming and beautiful. And he was a lawyer who was going to fight for people who hadn't been fought for, you know, and, and he was a con artist, right? And he, if you look back, and, and he shows up in the book, but he said all the same stuff as Trump. Like, he said, we're going to make America proud again, and we're going to fight. Sorry, go that ahead. That shocked me. I had no memory of that, but it's it's wild. It's so effective. And, and the populism that, that I bought into is, is a, I think, really similar to the populism that, that Trump supporters bought into. And I, uh, in, in writing about the current moment, I think it's really easy to say like, like look at all these naive racists, like they all have their, you know, rapist hosts on Fox News and you know, they're, they're being conned and, and swindled out of this. But I, 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 I think that we all have a little bit of an ability to be conned also. I, I, I don't think that there's any comparison between Obama and Trump in any in any real way, but if you look at even some of the early Obama speeches, they're they're full of platitudes and they're full of promises. And he's going to shut down Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay, and he's going to, you know, if you want to keep your health care, you can. And I I don't at all think he meant any of that insincerely, but I do think there's a world where no one tells the truth. And then if you're on the side that, if you are on the side looking at you know, the opposition not telling the truth, you, you get furious and, and you blame Fox News. And I do think Fox News is objectively worse than, than MSNBC, but I think it's important to understand one's own susceptibility to the, the stories that, that we want to believe. So I used cable news as, as I think, a, a, a metonym for all of those liberal instincts to feel like not only are we voting for better uh, policies, but that we are better people. But I, I, I wanted to make the reader squirm a, a, a little bit about, about what we are all um, proud of ourselves, you know, w when we watch TV and read Twitter. Yeah, you know, as you were saying, it, it occurred to me that a lot, of the, a lot of the book is also about, not just community, but also about what happens after a promise gets broken, whether it's a promise that you thought your young body had made to you, or a promise that uh, you thought the country had made, or a promise you thought your spouse had made. Um, how, how do you go about sort of situating all those different types of betrayal in a narrative? That's, ex that, that's exactly right. I, I think that looking back, I hadn't thought about it until you said that, but I, I think that there's a, when you're sick, and people don't realize how sick you are, and you know they, they look at you and you say they're dizzy, and they say, you know, oh my my grandmother was dizzy and she drank more water and was okay, or like have you gone on a vacation, or you know, and 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 every day you you feel as though people aren't understanding how miserable you are. I'm, I'm saying you, I, I mean I, I, I how miserable I was. I, I think I did want to just sort of scream at the world that, that like, look at all these suffering people, you know, and, and look at all these people who, who look fine and who look good and, and who look like they're, they, they have their lives together and, and, they're, and they're doing okay. And, and for some of us, it's, it's health issues. For others, it's marital infidelity, you know, and, and for others, it's professional disappointment and loss and losing parents. And, and, and I think there's a, a world of people, most people in this room who who suffer profoundly and who don't know how to talk about it and, and who don't have an easy 
outlet. And, and I think even within marriages that it, it can be hard sometimes where a spouse doesn't know how to, how to respond correctly or, or friendship. I mean, I, I remember I got so angry at people who asked me every day how I was feeling because I, I wanted to say like, I feel like shit, like stop, stop asking me. But I got as angry at the people who didn't ask me how I was feeling. Cause I, I'm like, don't you know, I feel like shit. Like, why don't you, why don't you? So there's a, there's a frustration that, that I think so many of us feel that is so acute when you're a, a teenager, I think, about the whole world not understanding you, and then becomes acute again at these moments of, of misery and, and, and disappointment. And I, and I think trying to tap into those feelings of betrayal, whether it's corporeal b betrayal or societal or marital or, or friendship is, um, was definitely the driving energy of the book. Um, and then when I went back and edited it, I, I wanted to make it funny and exciting too. But, but I, I do think the, the energy behind it is sort of a look at me energy in a way that a lot of us feel but don't have an outlet to articulate. Yeah. This will be the last question before we go to a Q&A, so get ready and they'll be bringing mics around. Um, the last thing I wanted to inquire about was that this this book is you know about communities about families about politics about kids but it also takes like a little detour into wellness into the sort of <laughs> um, the environment of, of self-care and wellness misinformation that we sort of live in uh, which is an interesting analog to the era of political misinformation we live in I think how did you go about putting the anxiety of all these sort of unproven treatments onto the page? So I, I wrote an article for the New York Times five years ago or so about what it was like to be as sick as I was. And I got a thousand plus responses, half of which were, I'm sick too, thank you for telling the world about people being sick. And the other half was like, have you tried peppermint oil? <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> And like I hadn't tried peppermint oil, so like I'm I'm not I'm not by disposition someone who's going to go try peppermint oil. But I was really sad and really sick, and, and I, I lost a lot of cynicism in that time. I've gotten some of it back, but I <laughs> I've lost a lot of I, I lost a lot of cynicism. So I did everything, and I went to the the herbalist who scolded me about how I drink too much orange juice and raw milk is the answer. And I, she has a guy in the back of the deli who gets her raw milk, you know, and I'm like, how is there a cow in the deli? And she didn't, <laughs> didn't have an answer. But like, I, I, went to the, I went to the herbalist and the, and the chiropractor and the, the breathing expert and the, the, the different types of acupuncture where they put needles in your brain and needles in your eyes and and what's fascinating there really wasn't the, the eye needle guy google it or don't google it i guess is <laughs> is really what i what i mean um and i i probably saw you know 20 of these people and 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 i'm still mystified by the degree to which they are charlatans or loving wonderful people uh, because none of them reached well uh, some of them reached out to me but most of, the one who reached out to me is those are charlatans and they're like um, I, I deal with manipulation of the bones in the brain, you know, so I showed up and they like manipulated the bones in my brain And then I'm like, I don't think brains have bones and and they're like, well, if this doesn't work Let's do acupuncture and he's like poking the same spot with needles and I asked politely to leave but like a lot of them were I, I was sent to by people who were cured by these people, you know, who came to me and said, I was like you I couldn't get out of bed, you know, I was vomiting every day or I was bleeding out of my nose and the nose doctor said there's no blood coming you know stories that just like don't make any sense but they were they were cured by the guy in Williamsburg who gives you the tea and then suggests you take like a lot of calcium you know and I did get a kidney stone from all that calcium so again like don't go to that guy but I I he was so nice like he and, and you go to these people and they say, I know what you have gone through. You've seen all the doctors and your blood tests are okay. And your, your inner ear tests are fine and your brain tests are fine. And really what happened, and then they start using vocabulary that is more metaphor than medical. You know, it's really what happened is your wires have crossed over and we need to through a series of, or really what's happened is a, is a nerve has been pinched in your, spinal column that, you know, and they say it and I'm like, ooh, like maybe a nerve is pinched in my spinal column because that's 
would be so great if all she had to do was like move around my spinal column. Um, and then they say, no, sometimes it takes a long time. And oh, no, your insurance doesn't cover it, but I'm giving you the best deal. And oh, well, if we keep on doing it, sometimes you feel better. And they ask you all the time, was this week a little bit better? You know, are you doing okay? You know, and it's like, oh, like my six-year-old, you know, is like, like I, is, this, it, I, is this written, I wrote my art, it's good, this looks like you, daddy, you know, and it's like, it, it doesn't look like me, but like I, <laughs> I, I tell him that it does, because like who can break the person's heart who, who, who is trying to make you happy? And I, so you, but then the doctor writes down on his notes, you know, like 5% better, you know, and then you show up the next week and he, the doctor, the, the gentleman. Um, the guy in Williamsburg. Right, the guy in Williamsburg. And he's like, and, and you're a little bit better? Like, like last time it was 5%, now you're 10% better? You know, and like, then he adds up all the percentages, you know, <laughs> and I'm 615% better. And like, I still cry every night. So I, I, I'm fascinated. That was using the present tense about the past. I cry less now. I, I, but I, I do think that there is this element of these people being really good people who want to care for you or total charlatans who want to bankrupt you. And I, who studied this stuff as much as I could and as much sophistication as I could was totally had and, and totally bought in. I, I can't imagine what the, the rest of the world who you know, d doesn't have that kind of academic background and ability to figure it all out feels like, because you're so hungry for a solution. So I, I don't at all begrudge going to these people. I think that some of them probably are magicians in, in their way who have some kind of healing touch. But God, after I spent nine months not eating dairy or soy or gluten or caffeine or chocolate or alcohol or vinegar or anything fermented or legumes or anything with added sugar. I mean, it just made everything worse, you know? Cause like chocolate's delicious, like legumes maybe less so, but chocolate <laughs> is delicious. Um, and that's what my book's about. Chocolate is delicious. <laughs> Thank you. Who's got a question? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I got the audible version and I'm about 10 chapters in and it's so superb. And I agree that the, uh, the female POV um, aspects are so sensitively written. So great job. Um, as someone who went to high Thank school you. with you, I am like, I'm glad to hear this is not um, autobiographical because I have, uh, admittedly, I was wondering how much of it is real and how much of it is, um, you know, truly fictional. So I guess like as an author, how much are you, um, what do you want your audience to think when about how much is true? Like David is someone with the same dizziness problem as you and lives in Brooklyn as you do. So I guess um, if you were, if you did design, if you were intentionally trying to make us think that parts of him are you, I guess, what are you trying to do to the audience in, in terms of uh, making uh, us believe? David is, is tall. <laughs> Did yes, I not I make that, that clear in the book? Yes, he's David <laughs> cannot be me because David is tall. Um, no, thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a great question. Although I think the literal stuff of nightmares, somebody beginning a sentence, <laughs> having gone to high school with you, comma, <laughs> that's, that's really... Um, no, no, it's gener it, it turned into a generous question, but it's... <laughs> A horrifying way to start a conversation. Um, <laughs> no, I, I use it. It's, it's awful of me, but it's, it's, it's a technique, you know? I, I think that I, I, one, it's the way that I, I most naturally come to, to writing, where I take, you know, a guy that kind of looks like Mike Etlin, wave Mike, and then I put my thoughts in him, and, and I, I, I try to exaggerate those thoughts in a dark and hungry and sad way to make the character more more compelling but but i think that the the honest answer is that in order for me to write emotions that feel true they have to start with me and emotions i have felt or people i love have felt and then i exaggerate them to fit the plot i then do think that i am a little bit sneaky in terms of my my awareness that 
if people read my bio quick or know me or have seen me talk or something, they might believe a little bit more. And maybe my work is a little bit easier if I, if I present a scenario that could potentially be true, even, even if it's not. Um, it is objectively not fair to um, my wife, but it is a technique that's uh, worth not being fair to my wife for, I, I think. <laughs> she's very generous. Mostly she's happy that I don't cry every night anymore. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's the answer. I, it, the, I use real emotions in situations that I think will make the novel a more exciting, dynamic read. And I take advantage of that when it's time to publicize it. So, Brian, I used to be your teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and I always cared about how much you learned. But now, lately, you are becoming my teacher with your second book and all the conversations that we have in, at the school and otherwise. And I'm very happy about that. But in kind of representing uh, our mutual uh, uh, students, I want to ask you, after finishing your second book, uh, what did you learn by putting this book together? Putting a book together is much, much more than just the sentiments and the emotions and all that stuff, but it's a lot of mechanics and writing skills. If uh, you could put it into words for uh, these students, first of all, and then for the rest of us. Absolutely, thank you. Next is, <laughs> I, I used to be Brian's stockbroker, and <laughs> you know, I, I, I as Brian's personal masseuse, I, I, that's a weird joke, sorry, I don't. Um, I, I learned two sets of um, things. One, one, and most profoundly, I was forced to think through what living with me was like for those years. And that, that really did mean a lot to me. I, I was... I took a lot of it for granted because so much of it was so painful that I didn't have, you know, the, the, the empathy left in me, I, I think. But the exercise of, of writing from the perspective of the best friend to somebody like me and the wife to somebody like me and parents and colleagues, et cetera, it, it really, I think, made me a more um, empathetic person. Um, and, and I think I've, I've tried to carry that, that on. Um, in terms of the craft of writing, which I think was, was more your question, um, the, the first novel I wrote, was there was a lot more natural of a progression of like, scary awful thing happens, which leads to next scary awful thing, which needs to le leads to next scary awful thing. Where this book, a lot of it took place in the, in the past, so you, I needed to, to create scenes in a way that I, I didn't really need to artificially create for the first book. And the idea of trying to map out more in terms of craft, like what is at stake in this moment? What does the reader know the character cares about? And then will that character achieve or not achieve that thing? I almost use that as a, as a check for every scene in the book. Because if, if you're writing about you know, murder and social uprising, it's all, it's all built in. You sort of, you, you have that to fall back on where people need to know whether that guy lives or dies. But in, in a scene that's more socio-emotional, I, I think that having that check in the back of my mind always, like, is the reader aware of what is at stake and what the character wants? And then is the reader either satisfied or then pushed on to the next thing? I, I learned to, to be way more focused on, um, on that technique specifically. Brian, I used to work with your mother. <laughs> as, as your mother's boss, I, yeah. I guess. <laughs> um, uh, your first book, I, I, I haven't read this, this one yet, I'm really looking forward to it. Your first book was very serious. There wasn't any humor in it, and I think you really are incredibly funny. And uh, I'm just wondering, is there humor in this second book? And is writing humor, I would think the craft of that is much harder than the delivery of speaking it? The answer is not really. Oh. There are moments of um, joy, you know? There, there are moments of sex and joy and kids doing kid stuff and, and sort of the, the daily um, excitement and levity that, that fills all of our lives. 
but there aren't it's it's there aren't a lot of jokes. I I I do some joke writing, you know, for for McSweeney's and for the New Yorker sometimes and stuff like that. And it's a it's it feels um like a a, a very important and wonderful and and for some extent harder, but but more superficial enterprise where you write a joke by making somebody think you're going to write something, but then you write the other thing, you know, and like it's it's a little bit color by number. Whereas this, I I I wanted to get to the the heart of why people feel the way they do in times when they have trouble articulating those feelings, and 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 there there was a draft that. I didn't show my my editors uh, th that was that was a little bit sticky, you know. That that was like more about the the herbalist who can't cure people with her herbs, and like that's definitely in the book, and it might make you giggle. But I I, I do feel like there is time for humor, and like I'm kind of funny, but I'm not really funny, you know. Like there are like you can go see Seinfeld perform, and like he's funny. Uh, like I what what I do I I think is is try to try to create um, moments of levity and joy within the hideous world in which we all exist. <laughs> and just while you're waiting for the mic, sorry, you mentioned the audiobook version. Um, the guy's a genius, so I'm not, I'm not an audiobook listener because I read and I listen to other stuff, but um, Ari Fliakos, who did my book, is is one of the best actors in New York and one of the best audiobook guys. So if you're um, audio agnostic, uh, give it give it a try. Uh, so I guess piggybacking off of your question about writing about reality, were you at all nervous about doing that? Like maybe Tazu, I'm not sure if he's based off of a real friend, but he like, is. were you, okay, so so my question, like if you, you know, if the real life Tazio kind of read that and saw that you characterized him in certain ways that maybe he thought were untrue or like offensive or something like that, how like has he approached you? How have you responded? What have those kind of interactions with the sort of real life fictional characters been like? No, he hasn't spoken to me since, but it was worth sacrificing the friendship. <laughs> You know, you have a lot of friends in life, but you don't have a lot of novels. So, um, no, I mean, the, the, the real life, the, the, the guy on whom it is usely based, um, loosely based, as I start stuttering into this, um, uh, the, the character isn't him at all. The, the character is superficially him, and I love him enough, and he loves me enough to have had that conversation before I started writing. And the, the aspects of it that are true or true-ish, I, I made a point to sit down with him or her <laughs> and, uh, and talk through. Um, and he or she read, he read an advanced copy and and it, it was Im important to me that, that he was on board. There are adjacent characters, though, um, whom I don't really care about, and, and who, who are based on people who don't mean anything to me, or who mean slightly less to me. Um, <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if I... <laughs> Dan Melnick? No, that'd be... That's a weird, that's a weird joke to make. To um, <laughs> but I... I th th those people I care about... Um, I... I, I checked with, um, and those people who are tangentially involved with my life in superficial ways, I didn't, and I probably should have. Since you named me, now I have to ask a question. <laughs> so I've always been curious, both with authors and with, with playwrights, is how you decide how many actual characters you're going to have. Um, so it sounds like there's four main characters in, um, you know, in the book. Were there other characters that at some point you said, oh, this is a main character in... Yeah, and I, it's, a, it's a great question, and I, I, I think that I come to it in terms of the, the difference between flat and round characters, where I think that if the book is going to sit at around 300 pages, four characters is pushing it if you're going to really know who they are and really care about them, and, and if I am going to do my best to differentiate how they see the world and, and behave. Um, in this book, I needed four characters because I needed to balance the, the male and female, and I needed to create different um, sort of types of victimization among those four. 
And then I took everybody else who is either based on somebody or who's necessary for plot or, or who whatever it is, and I made him or her serve the purpose that he or she needs to serve in order for the main characters to shine and, and be fully three-dimensional. So I, I took liberties, I, I made those four characters as real and alive as I could, and then I, with help from two brilliant editors, I pared down on, on everybody else, is the answer, because I saw that some of them were in these in-between worlds where you, know, you don't know whether you're supposed to care about them or not, and they just get in the way. I, I think it's important to answer your question um, mo more, more specifically. It's important as a writer to know the characters whose vision of the world you're going to prioritize, and then to let everybody uh, fall away a little bit as not to get in the way. Gee, this is not a question. Um, as a person who knew you since you were 11, 12, 13 years old. He was my rabbi. And, uh, <laughs> Literally, the man was my rabbi. And uh, I remember, contrary to being your rabbi, I remember you in your Grace Church uniform as a, as a student. Just wanted to say that I imagine I could speak for a lot of people here, that we are so, so happy for you in your health and uh, in your success. We cavell with you. We are <laughs> very, very happy for you. Thank, thank you so much for saying that. And, and thank you all, all of you um, who, to, to various degrees, really do mean the world to me. I, 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 I didn't used to be sort of, I, I'm still not by disposition a, a grateful for every day kind of guy, but I, <laughs> I, I do live life in, in awe these days of like what I get to do and, and mostly the, the people I get to, to spend time with, the fact that I can, can be with my kids and my wife and my friends and my colleagues and my students and my family and friends of my parents and my kids' parents. I'm my kids' parents, <laughs> but everybody else, everybody other than my kids' parents. I, um, no, but I, I, I turn it into shtick by disposition, and I, I, I really don't mean to. I'm sorry. I, didn't, I went in that direction because it's what I do and I, I get uncomfortable, but to, to be honest, Thank all of you so much for putting up with me and for being in, in my life to the extent you are. I love most of you and care about some of you. And, um, and ag <laughs> I love you guys. Thank you so much. And to Amanda Mall, whom I'm learning to love, and to The Strand, <laughs> and to everybody who put this together. Thank you guys so much. And um, this is uh, dream come true stuff. So thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>